Can they do it? Let's go. And Deegan has a good and start. And the Moto Sport Talk about whole shot. Hey, Deegan. Huge victory in Moto He's going to do it again in Moto Ten 2. Sexton wins the first Moto But this time, Hunter and Jeff Lawrence are right there, as is Chase Sexton. Yeah, welcome back to Racing. SMX Insider coming your way. We are the Jasons, Wygant, and Thomas. Round 22 of the Super Moto Cross World Championship is round five of the AMA Pro Moto Cross Championship at the legendary WIC 338, or Southwick, Massachusetts, as we call it. JT, so we had a weekend off to digest what has happened so far, and there's one major thing that keeps sticking out in your mind. What is that? Well, I think for everybody, if you had told them that Jet Lawrence is healthy, he's still in the series, but he doesn't have the points lead this far into the championship, everybody would wonder what's wrong. How can that possibly be true? But here we are. And not, not only is he not your points leader, he's in a three-way dogfight for this championship too. Now, I know where you're going to go, Weech. So mm -hmm. just give it to me. Give me the pushback. Yeah. He crashed in one moto. He's not even 100%, and he still won the next three motos in a row. And the only overall he didn't win was the one weekend where he crashed. So everybody's going to say, JT, did you not watch Hangtown? It explains itself. Well, that, that is why we go racing is because there is all of this up and down and the series can be a roller coaster. And I would also remind you, Weege, that we have the Super Motocross playoffs coming up that are three rounds. And if something like this happens in one of those rounds, guess what? You don't have another 18 or 20 motos to make up for it. So I just think it shows you that this 450 class hasn't been everything we thought it would be. It hasn't been this runaway championship that we expected from Jet Lawrence. And we don't know where it goes from here. I would also agree with you that Jet Lawrence is the best rider, but we're pretty far into this thing and he does not have the red plate. Uh, two rounds after a disastrous crash and he's right back within range. I think the bigger question is, I, I think we would agree on this. He was not the same level of race winner at Thunder Valley and High Point. So the real question is, is this weekend off and Southwick, that's a good track for him. Are we going to go back to 2023 level Jet? Because certainly Sexton was giving him all he could handle down the stretch of high point, and Hunter's been close in a lot of motos since. So, I, JT, I think that's the bigger question. They were close the last two rounds, even though they didn't win. Do you think that can keep up? Not this weekend. Uh, I think Hunter has a chance. This is a track he has done really well on. It's a, the round he got his first ever win on in 2021. But I do think it sets up really nicely for Jet. You mentioned the weekend off. He got more time to heal, more time to get back to his old self. And I also think he's one of the premier sand riders, at least on this side of the Atlantic anyway. So if you're looking for him to bounce back and maybe get that red plate back, this is a really, really nice weekend for it. But keep in mind, we are going to Chase Sexton's home track of Red Bud the following weekend. So everything that swings his way this week, maybe it's a chance to swing the other way the following weekend. Well, Southwick, yeah, it really does stick out as one of the unique rounds. So we'll see how that plays out. And here's how you folks can see it. We'll have race day live coverage presented by motosport.com at 10 a.m. Eastern this Saturday. That's qualifying a one hour show. And the motos start at one o'clock Eastern. We'll have four straight hours of live moto coverage and a halftime show in between and a post race show. So dial us in, it'll be Peacock or the SMX video pass outside the United States. And we'll have a new member of the broadcast team. Let's talk to him. Okay, a very special big interview here. Adam Cincerullo, you're going to join us as part of the broadcast this weekend from Southwick. You're going to be in the trenches as a reporter with JT, talking about the track and what you see. So I think a lot of fans thought someday we'll see Adam as part of the show. Were, were you thinking that? And then is it almost like, wow, this is really happening now? Like, how do you process all this now that it's pretty much here? Yeah, it's happened really quickly. I think in the past... It was always difficult for me to stay on the track and be out there all the time. So I've had a couple opportunities to do the do the reporting, the sideline reporting and get in the booth. And I always surprised myself. I loved it every time I did it. And um, it's it's a different, obviously it's a different perspective. It's kind of a different uh, relationship I feel I have with the sport in that role. But yeah, I'm really excited. I think it all came up pretty quick this year with kind of the retirement announcement and then and then getting into this so really grateful to uh, to be making this transition and and thank you guys for for having me i certainly have a lot to live up to with you guys one of the questions i have for you you know you're really close to a lot of these riders you've raced 
all of them going into this role. So in some instances, you have to be a little bit critical. Maybe something happens where you don't think that was a brilliant move and you have to share that perspective. How are you gonna go about that? Because you don't want to offend your friends, but you also have to be honest and, and add perspective to the show as well. Yeah, it's, it's difficult, right? Like I, having just come from racing, we all know how difficult it is, right? But I, I have it fresh, fresh on my mind. I was there, you know, getting 14th and 15th, and I felt like I was going pretty fast, right? So who am I to jump on the broadcast and start criticizing these guys? But the way I look at it is, yes, I will always have so much respect uh, for these guys, but that's just the role I'm in now. Um, um, the role I'm in is to, to call it how I see it and, and to add as much value as I can. So. I can't let friendships get in the way. Of course, I would like to always, you know, put a positive spin on things when it's applicable, but sometimes it's gonna be some moves I'm gonna have to call out and hopefully those guys will forgive me. You know, when I'm watching races, even this year, I'm always, I'm always, um, you know, with racing, I'm always listening to you guys as much as I'm paying attention to the track. I'm like, oh, wow, we each, or uh, RC or Stu, man, they really articulated that well, right? I'm a nerd in that way. Um, some other sports, like you see Pat McAfee, I'm a big fan of his ESPN kind of personality. I love that he puts his own spin on things. JJ Redick is another former basketball player that's well, he's coaching the Lakers now, but um, that's really excelled in kind of that media role. So I definitely have plenty to look up to. Um, but yeah, always paying attention. We, you know me. Oh, yeah, that's where we love it. And I think the fans are going to be pumped to have you on board this weekend. So we'll have you on the sidelines with JT this weekend. We'll get you in for a few more this year. And really, just welcome aboard, Adam. Yeah, thank you guys very much. I look forward to having a good time. 30-second board time. Let's look at the hot topics in SMX right now. It don't get much hotter than Hayden Deegan, who even when he doesn't win, that still might have been his best race of the year, the incredible comebacks at high point. And a 30-plus point lead this early in the season? That seems impossible that you could have that big a lead already. Yeah, these pivotal moments in a series, and they may seem subtle at the time, but him going out and even though he didn't win the overall high point, him getting the points that he did, coming from the back the way he did, and going into, let's just say it, this is probably going to be the most challenging round of the series for him at Southwick with a 32-point lead does so much for his comfort, his confidence, and I just think it proved that he's been the best rider unequivocally through the first four rounds. So it's been Hayden Deegan's series so far. We'll see what it looks like after his toughest race of the series, but it's, I think it's impossible to say he hasn't been the guy thus far. You say toughest race of the series. He's admitted coming from Southern California. He's not a sand expert, but Monster Energy, Yamaha Star Racing rented Southwick out, I believe last Thursday, to try to get in as much time as possible. So that's going to help him a little bit. Or does that show to you like, oh man, they've really got to, almost overcompensate for this track well I, I applaud the effort if you don't make you know real efforts to work on your weaknesses then i would ask what are you doing so they know this is one of the most challenging tracks it's a track that requires a different setting and setup for the riders than any other round and it's also where hayden deegan really struggled last year and he doesn't or at least he doesn't want to struggle as much as he did would be the round where he goes out and dominates probably not but if he can improve his positioning by a couple of spots, that will do so much for his championship hope. So I always say you can look for to see who wants to win the most by the effort behind the scenes. And I think that Monster Energy Yamaha, Monster Energy Star Yamaha, excuse me, both by adding Max Anstey and getting Hayden Deegan some extra work in the sand, they're doing everything they can possibly do. Yes, adding Max Anstey. Talk about this deal a little bit. That's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, you know, we all saw how well he rode at times, and, and he had some really tough moments during Monster Energy Supercross 2, but I think he's going back to a team that is a proven winner. And think about, he raced for this team in 2010. How long ago he was a part of this effort and what that team looked like then and what it looks like now. Most of the paddock thinks that this is the most potent motorcycle on the racetrack. So for Max, it has to be an attractive landing spot. And he's going from a privateer effort where he was really, I think, overperforming necessarily what his motorcycle was, was capable of. And now he's going to arguably the best motorcycle on the racetrack. So you put Max Anstey in the sand on arguably the best bike. I don't know how this isn't set up perfectly for success. 
And shout out to two things. A, Star, who can always find money in the couch cushions to start paying Anstey now. And they had to, because Anstey was supposed to race for Firepower Honda all the way through all the off-season Supercross and international events. It's an Australia-based team. He's the Australian Supercross champ. He gave up all that money by not racing in the fall. Star's paying him early to get that back. And then shout out to Yuri Konsky, the team owner of that team, letting him go. Not going to get him to run a number one plate in Supercross internationally. So it's good to see them work it out. And this should be, to your point, pretty fun to see Anstey race Southwick, which might not have happened if the two teams hadn't been able to agree and Max himself on a deal. But this is the way it goes sometimes. Look at Pro Circuit. No one thought Ty Masterpool would be the one winning the 300th ever event for that team. He wasn't even on the team when they won 299. Now, look. JT, I've been mocked. I've been teased by you and our buddy Steve Mathis over how good I think Masterpool can be. I've already proven myself, bro. I've already proven myself. He's won. We got to look at the other guys on the team. Here is the list of injured riders. Boland, Hamaker, McAdoo, Forkner. I got another question for you. What happened to Levi Kitchen? We left round one thinking he was right there with Deegan. He's almost 50 points behind. What's going on here? Well, think about how long we had been talking about this 299th win going into 300. And it was almost a foregone conclusion that it would be Levi Kitchen who got this job done. And why wouldn't we think that as well as he was riding coming out of Monster Energy Supercross where he, he didn't get it done, let's be real. But also how well he rode at the opener. It was almost like, yeah, this is just a matter of time. But here comes Ty Masterpool and we j I'm not giving it to you. Uh, you used the word championship and he's 75 points down after four rounds. But to your point, he is riding exceptionally well and he's gotten better and better. We, we saw how difficult it is to transition to a new motorcycle, a new team right off the bat, big crashes, didn't really end up where he wanted to be. But a few weeks later, some testing, getting comfortable. Now he's a real contender. So. I expect him to see see him in the top five the rest of the way, but this is just an incredible moment. His first win, the 300th win for Mitch Payton. You know, the again, this has been the year of script writing, and how could you write it any better than that at High Point? I'll tell you what you can do if you want to have a good time at these races. That is camping. Uh, that's a legendary part of most of the Pro Moto Cross rounds. Not uh, Southwick. They don't have the room for it. But we saw people out in droves at High Point. We'll see it again at Redbud. And we've taken that element from Pro Moto Cross and baked it into the SMX playoff rounds. All three will offer trackside camping. You can see some of the fun people had at those races last year. So if you're near ZMAX Dragway, Charlotte Motor Speedway, if you're near Texas Motor Speedway, if you're near the strip at Las Vegas and Las Vegas Motor Speedway. Don't just come to the race. Do it this way. It's a lot more fun. JT, I'm sure you spent a lot of nights at a racetrack yourself. Yeah, and we've already heard from Ricky Carmichael. He's planning on joining the fun in Charlotte. So if you want to go have a great time, you want to maybe have an adult beverage with the GOAT, Ricky Carmichael, I don't know how it sets up any more perfectly for, for Charlotte and the rest of the other rounds for camping as well. Now, speaking of camping out at Southwick and hoping to get back into this championship, I think Tom Bial is the story. And I felt, you know, the way I talked about earlier with Hayden Deegan being such a pivotal round and you really didn't think about it so much at High Point, I think it was the opposite for Tom Vial at High Point struggling because he was in the lead in that first moto. You think about what that could have done, swinging the momentum his way going into a track where I think all of us are looking at him having his best chance to win. He goes 1-3 there last year. He gets the overall. And I think this was really the arrival onto the scene for Tom Vial. The problem is he's so many points down in the championship now. He could go in and dominate Southwick and it's still not be enough to really be taken seriously against Hayden Deegan. So we have a, long, a lot of racing left. There are rounds where he does ride very well, but I just thought it was such a difficult setup leaving High Point now going into his best round and you're still hoping he climbs back into the championship but he let so many points slip away so many points that he's not even second in the championship we mentioned levi kitchen dropping back as well chance hymas who was nowhere in supercross no podiums showed a little bit of speed here and there is now second in the 250 pro motocross standings and with that he's rocketed up the smx standings as well uh but what is the data on him and Sand and Southwick, what do you think we have here for uh, Hymas? Can he keep this going? I think he'll be okay. You know, it's not his natural terrain. Like he grew up in, in Southern Idaho. It's pretty hard pack, but 
he's been in Florida for two years now. He's he's ridden with Jet and Hunter and these guys. He, I'm sure that he's learned a lot. They've been out riding at Croom Motorcycle Park, which is as about as sandy as you'll ever get. So is it the best setup for him? Maybe not, but I think he'll be just fine. And not every round has to be your best one. You know, I thought High Point set up really nicely for him. If you look back at his results for 2023, as long as he can hang around that podium, top five, keep the points kind of the status quo, I think it's just fine. Okay, time now for a new segment of SMX Insider. It is our SMX Medical Update with Dr. Joe McGinley. Some of you fans have probably seen him on our broadcast at the races. But for those who haven't, just tell us your story here. Yes, you are a true MD. You went to college. You have all the degrees. But also, race some motocross yourself growing up. Yeah, great. We, it's great to be on the show. Uh, wonderful to contribute and talk about riders' injuries and, and provide some information. You're absolutely right. I, I raced uh, back in the day. I still get out there on the track. Obviously, nowhere near the level of uh, you know JT or any of these other guys out there racing. Uh, I was a local B rider, but yeah, I did it for over 15 years. Uh, so I know what some of the injuries, I know what the riders are dealing with. And providing just background and information and perspective uh, is what we're here to do. And it's great to contribute and uh, work with uh, your team and the fans. So I think for a lot of people that, you know, core fans of the sport to hear that a doctor is specializing and really working with motocross specific injuries or just things that are going to help them perform to their best. I think that raises a lot of questions. So can you tell us a little bit about how different it is working on a motocross athlete and their specific injuries versus maybe like a stick and ball sport athlete? Yeah, JT, that's a great question. Uh, we deal with athletes, pro athletes in all different sports, and uh, you have to take that sport into consideration what the goals of the athletes are and what the expectations are of that particular sport. And uh, I'll give one example, and that's ACL injuries. And uh, if you look at NFL, for example, uh, pro football players, when they tear their ACL, it's highly uncommon for them to get back out on the field for at least seven months, eight months after that injury. Uh, whereas with pro motocross, we're seeing racers getting back out there and competing uh, like nothing happened three to four months out. And that's the that's the nuance of, of the sport itself, the different stresses on the joint, the different stresses on those ligaments and how they're training and recovering and getting back out there. Uh, so that's a significant difference. And that's related to the, the, the stresses of the sport in general. So I'm really hearing you say is that our motocross athletes are the toughest that you've seen and, and we can heal faster and get back out there quicker. Is that what you're telling me? Because I would love to run with that narrative. I'm not disagreeing with that. As a rider and a fan of the sport, uh, I'm going to agree with you 100%, JT. All right, let's resume 30-second board now. Well, I guess you're right about something, JT. You top thought at the beginning of this show is how close the points were. Here it is. It's, it's, it's on the graphics. So let's talk about this three-way battle. And yes, I do believe it's a little different because if you're Chase Sexton, true or not true, I'm sure in his head he's saying high point was mine. I had it. I should have won. Could have won. So both mathematically, he and Hunter Lawrence are ahead of Jet, but I've got to think at least confidence-wise, Chase is there, but I don't think Southwick is Chase's best track. What do you think about him and Hunter against Jet this weekend? Well, I think perspective goes a long way because you could look at it in a positive light, and if you asked Chase Sexton through four rounds, under any circumstances, would you take being ahead of Jet Lawrence in the points? And I think you would say absolutely, I don't care what other detail you throw at me, I'll take it. But if you look at the opportunity that he's left on the table at both Thunder Valley where Jet was not 100% and Chase had a very poor day, and then at High Point where Jet's kind of wavering and Chase again throws away the lead in the second moto, that's a you could look at it that way, right? And, and it's all about perspective. But I think in the end, you have to block out the mistakes. You have to block out everything else and say, hey, if you want a chance to win this championship, there's been four rounds. Hunter's ahead of you, sure, six points, not a big deal, but you're ahead of Jet. And you couldn't say that at any point in this championship in 2023. So agree with you that this is not the best round for him, but I think for the confidence level of these riders, it's all about finding silver linings. It's all about waking up every morning and saying, okay, what's the good in today? How do I build upon today? Because negative thoughts, if you allow them to creep in, can really be pervasive and I think for Chase especially he's been a victim of that in the past where he's allowed these problems to kind of multiply so I think this weekend's a big one if he can just maybe split points with Jet I think that would be a huge win forget about the red plate for now 
And then you own a red bud, which is a great race for him. I don't have silver linings here. I'm a realist, JT. I think this particular track, the gap between Jet and the competition grows. He spent a lot of time, more time really, in his younger years growing up in sand than even Hunter. When they moved to Europe, he was even younger. I feel like Jet's skill set and his riding style, standing up, is a little more of a sand guy than even Hunter is. So I feel like they got to write off this weekend. If Jet puts it to them, they got to say, well, that was just Southwick. But you're saying you think Hunter actually don't be surprised at Southwick for him. Well, on the other hand, yes, I think it is going to be a tough day for Chase. And I do think that Hunter and Jet are better in these conditions. And you look at the history of their riding, how much time they've spent in the sand, racing over in Europe in these conditions, what their skill set is really suited for. They should have a phenomenal day. This is the site of Hunter Lawrence's first ever win. Back in 2021, he went 1-1 on the day, which was kind of out of nowhere. That was not an expected result, and everybody had to kind of take a step back and go, hey, this kid might be for real, and then you fast forward three, re three years and we know he is. But then also for Jet, I think he really flows in this type of track, and they know this, right? Chase knows this isn't the best track for him. Jet and Hunter know that this is a great track for them, and that really starts to work against them or for them. So, yes, as much as I want to say that's okay day for Chase and maybe he can find a way, you look at Jet riding at Kroom with Chance Hymas and Hunter preparing just in the deep sands that have these really produced guys like Kenny Keelan going back to the 70s and 80s. It's a track that Ricky Carmichael grew up riding. RJ Hampshire grew up about 15 minutes from there. These are the hallowed grounds that sand riders are produced from. And guess what? That's where Jet and Hunter have been for the past two weeks, just hammering motos. That's so funny. Yeah, Kroom, that's not even a racetrack, right? That's just a, I rode there just once. A, you probably rode there one million times. It's just a riding spot. Yep. It's just an off-road torture park. It absolutely will beat you into submission. But guess what? When you show up on race day, you're that much better for it. Let's look at the SMX playoff schedule here. We want to remind, yes, you're right. If you make one big mistake in these, you're not going to be able to make up for it. It's three races for the big money and the pride of being the SMX world champion. That will start September 7th, Z-Max Dragway in Concord, North Carolina. Texas Motor Speedway, that's a new venue for us. We're racing there. And then the strip at Las Vegas Motor Speedway, that's a drag strip, a four-wide one like the one we saw in Charlotte. But they have a little more room, actually, to work with even beyond. So it'll be really interesting how those track layouts turn out. It was funny. I was actually reading a story uh, by Dan Beaver of NBC Sports. He was talking to Dave Prater from uh, Fell Motorsports. And Prater said, we hope to still be able to surprise the riders like we did last year because, boy, were they out of sorts when we got to those hybrid tracks. They were not ready, but it kind of led to entertaining and unpredictable results. One thing that is predictable, though, we want to give a shout out to this guy, the veteran out of Sweden, Freddie Norin. When you get outdoors, just pencil in top 10 finishes every week and look at what it has done, JT. He's gone from outside the top 20 and combined SMX points. He's already up to 14th now. Yeah, these subtle, subtle differences that the SMX playoff, it, this has created all of this. And you see me there interviewing Freddie. He had just won the FMF Privateer Power Award, but he is a force outdoors. And the, the difference between his ability in Monster New Supercross and then here in Pro Motocross is stark. And I think the, the key there, the point of that, is think about what if he wasn't so good at promoter cross and he had to ride the LCQ every single weekend for the playoff rounds, he's not going to have to. He's going to be seated in the amount of money that that's going to garner him, the amount of stress that's going to take off of his shoulders, and he's earning it every step of the way, every moto he goes out there. But it, it just shows you these two different disciplines, how different the skill sets are, but how much they have come, come together to create this one championship. You don't have to be incredibly good if you're really good at the other. And Freddie Noren is the poster boy for that. Yeah, well, no stress for Freddie Noren in motocross. He's good in all conditions. But there was some stress over the conditions for the folks that operate the WIC 338 over the weekend, man. Yeah, and you think about all the track prep that has to go on. They're a week out and they have to deal with this monsoon, right? There's literally a river running through the Southwick racetrack. This is a week ahead of the event. And thankfully the weather has subsided a bit, but you think about all the prep and all the work that had been done before this, that's now out the window. They're gonna have this dial. These, these guys are professionals, but 
yes, to your point, the stress that this probably caused and the extra work is amazing. Now, what it means for the riders, it's going to be a different type of racetrack. All of this rain packs that sand in. So you're thinking about the fluffy rolling bumps of Southwick. That's not what this is going to be. It's going to be a faster, harder Southwick, a choppier Southwick, which means the riders will have to adjust their motorcycle settings exactly for that. And there will be a few riders that are familiar with anything that Southwick can throw at them. That is the legend of this race. The locals coming out, often leading laps, battling for podiums. We don't know who will come out of the woodwork necessarily to do that this year. But one story we're definitely tracking, Tony LaRusso, who you used to race, JT. But he was a veteran even when you were racing him. He's 52 and he's going to try to race and qualify. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, I, I remember riding with him in Florida when I was 15 years old. I also remember him leading the Southwick National for 25 minutes in 1996. So in true Southwick fashion, you think about the races that Doug Henry and John Dowd have had way past the primes of their career. It's going to be very hard for everybody to not be cheering on Tony LaRusso as he's getting out there. And let's hope he qualifies. We all know that little secret about the qualifying sessions at Southwick, getting out there on the smooth racetrack. But what a story that would be if Tony LaRusso can qualify for these motos. Yeah, he'll race at 250. He'll be in the very first practice on Saturday morning when the track should be totally smooth and at his fastest. He definitely doesn't need to go slow for a lap to learn the layout of the racetrack. He can pin it right off the bat. That'd be unbelievable. Tony hasn't raced the Southwick National since 2012, but he races all the time, amateur stuff, local stuff. So we'll see how he does. And that would just be another piece of the local lore at the Wick. SMX Facts time. We mean that literally now. Clinton Fowler, our stat man, is going to talk SMX playoff projections, who might be in, who might be out. Let's talk 450s first. Clinton, what's some of the notable info there? Yeah, we, I think the first thing we got to look at is those that have won a race and have an automatic bid into the LCQs. Now, it's only the LCQ, so not exactly a lot to motivate these guys, but Jet Lawrence, Cooper Webb, Chase Sexton, Eli Tomac, Ken Roxon, Aaron Plessinger, those guys in the 450s, they've got the automatic bid because they've won a race this year. So that's the first piece. But then, we the big thing is the top 20 cutoff line. And right now, that sits at 121 points. But I think we're going to see a fair amount of competition come up and see that number rise to more like 150, maybe even 160, depending on what people end up doing at the end of the year. And JT, there's a crop of guys that I think are on path. You've got the Freddie Norn and the Christian Craig who look like in the next two or three rounds, they're going to be in. But then there's another set of three guys that I think are really interesting. Grant Harlan, Phil Nicoletti, Marshall Welton. Those three, they've got to continue performing at the same level and make it through the year. What do you think, what do you think for pressure that those guys are feeling right now? Well, I think they just understand the task at hand, right? All, all three of those riders either didn't participate in the, the class that they're hoping to get into the Super Motocross playoffs in, 450 class, and during Supercross, or they had poor Supercross series in the case of Grant Harlan. So I think that they are kind of coming into form right now. We saw all three of them either back in action or really breaking out in the case of Grant Harlan again at high point. So I think there's nothing but to look at this as a positive, right? You've had a really tough year. Now you're starting to find your form and everything is in front of you. If you can perform now, you're going to be set up nicely for September. Okay, let's switch 250 class and kind of talk those same topics. There's a lot more movement, a lot more unpredictability, it feels like, when you look at 250s. There are 12 250 riders that qualify for an automatic LCQ bid, from RJ Hampshire to Ty Masterpool here at the last uh, race at Mount Moore. So those guys are automatically in the LCQ. The cut line for the 250s is 160 points. Um, guys like RJ Hampshire automatically in, but I also think with his 195 points from his championship gets him automatically into the top 20. So um, a fair amount of guys in good position there. Yeah, the, the pressure is on and no one wants to go to those LCQs at those Super Motocross playoff rounds. It's just not a very fun place to be. And also when you think about those riders, those 11 riders who have automatically gotten that LCQ bid, it's such a daunting task to get through the LCQ. And then you have this really difficult starting position 
for the main event. That's what they always talk about is, yes, I think I'm good enough to qualify it every time through the LCQ, but the gate position for when the points and the money are paid out put me in such a difficult place. So I think for everybody, getting into the top 20 is the name of the game. You do not want to be sitting on that starting line for the LCQs. Yes, and that's going to move us into some other riders. When will RJ Hampshire be back? Cameron McAdoo, Seth Hamaker, other riders you would consider SMX World Championship contenders. How quickly can they get back and improve their seating? Hey, Clinton, last year, Deegan only won by five points. He beat Shimoda by five points. So this seating is going to be maybe everything come September. Yeah, I mean, a guy like RJ Hampshire, it's looking like he's probably going to be 18th or 19th in the standings. That could be a 20, 21 point difference in the seeding points. That's massive come that last round, especially knowing what we learned last year. All right. So we're going to be keeping an eye both on Pro Moto Cross and the SMX combined standings as we get ready for the playoffs in September. A little fun extra math for you. So thanks for the effort. Okay, we're going to wrap this episode of SMX Insider, but there is one other thing about Southwick that we need to mention that we haven't yet, and that is occasionally there are heartbreak within these hills. We have seen a lot of bikes break on this track through the years, JT. You never know when it's coming or who it's going to happen to, but it almost seems inevitable every weekend you go to this track. Yeah, we've seen craziness happen here. You go back to Christoph Purcell having a heartbreaking mechanical failure here. Hunter Lawrence had a recent issue here, almost cost him the championship. Remember Ryan Dungey missing the start, and we would be remiss if we didn't mention Jason Wygant also missing the start of this Southwick race. So anything can happen when we go up to New England. I would like to say that was mechanical or technical issue related as well. It happens to everyone here. So uh, watch out. We saw the track was nearly washed out a week ago. You never know what's going to happen there. So tune us in, and we'll see you on Saturday.